Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, open to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll get there in a minute, but I'm going to give you a chance to get there first. Before we get into the message today, there's something that uh, I want to just share with you that, that God has kind of laid on my heart. Um, we have been working through um, what God has to say about money in His Word. And uh, I think it's a very important issue because there's over a thousand scriptures that deal with the issue of money. There's over a hundred that deal specifically with instruction on money. In his ministry here on earth, Jesus spent more time talking about money than heaven and hell combined. Okay. And I think it's an important issue because I think if we're not careful, money very insidiously works its way into our lives and before we know it, we're worshiping money and not God. So I, I think it's an important issue that needs to be addressed. But I think, you know, sometimes in looking at these issues, we forget the greater issue, and that the greater issue is always salvation. And that's what our heart's drive should be, is that we are lights in a dark world, that we are his ambassadors to a, a foreign country. We're strangers in this land. And our calling, our commission, our task is that we would go. Now, I, I did not know they were doing that song today until this morning. Okay, so um, this was not coordinated other than God coordinating it. And I just want to lay before you, our task is to share the gospel, the good news, with people that need to hear it. It's not my job, it's not your job to get people saved. That's God's job. It's our job to bear witness to what He's already done for us. Okay? Uh, in my life, God took me from a a clinically depressed person with anger issues and made me a not nearly as depressed and not nearly as angry person. And he's making me into a better person as we go. Okay, that's the process of him taking what is unholy and, and working it through and perfecting that holiness in my life. Um, and, and everybody here, it is my hope that you have a testimony similar to mine. Not, not necessarily the location you came from, okay? You might have been in my part of the pit, but you might have been somewhere else in the pit entirely. But the point is that he reached down into that pit and he pulled us out and he set us in a high place. He cleaned us up, he washed us, he gave us clothes of white raiment. He anointed our wounds with the balm of Gilead. He brought healing and, and he restored to us what was intended at creation, a right relationship with God. Okay? So I would just encourage you today, if you do not have that relationship with God, there's no magical formula to it. There, there's no special thing that you need to do. Uh, there's not a certain process. There's no dance moves involved. Uh, I have seen people dance when they met the Lord. I have, I have seen people do fancy footwork when they met the Lord. I've seen people fall on their face and weep. But the, the point is, you know, Scripture says that we believe and we confess. Okay, that, those are the two things. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, it, it tells us that, that it's a gift. It's, it's freely given. And, and God's grace combined with faith that He provides for us because in and of ourselves we don't understand what is necessary. That's why it's faith. It's without comprehension. That equals salvation. As a matter of fact, Paul makes it very clear that's all unto salvation. And then after that comes works that God has prepared for us to do. We don't work unto salvation. There's nothing you can, oh, if I, I give more money. We're talking about money. Money will not buy you away into heaven. Okay? Your, your acts of righteousness, oh, if I feed the, the hungry, or if I, I help the little old lady across the street, or I hold the door, or 
You know, the, the acts don't bring salvation, but they should be a result of. Out of the rebirth that you have, there should be works that come out of that that just show they're a reflection of our Lord and Savior. And you look at his ministry here on earth, and it was all about service. He even made it so important that he said, if, if you want to lead in this body, in this church, you've got to be a servant. You've got to serve. And we've got it so twisted around, we like to inbreed our politics with it, and we want it to be, you know, if, if you're going to lead, you've got to be the boss, you've got to be the mouth, you've got to be the one in charge. That's not what Jesus says. He says you serve. And, and he did this after he had washed the disciples' feet. And that, that's like the low of the low. Because man in, in Israel, there's dirt everywhere. And they're... they're feet were open. They were wearing open sandals and, 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 and they were leather and when I don't know about you guys but when you put leather on your feet and you walk in a hot place with a bunch of dirt, your feet sweat and they stink and they get dirty. And so Jesus bows himself before them and he washes their feet. And this is the, the outgrowth that should be in our lives that, that we go and we realize that hey, you know, I, I am of no more significance than you. But God reached down and in his desire longed to have intimate relationship with me. He longed to have intimate relationship with you and we should serve one another. So I want to always keep us on task. Our task is salvation. That's, that's, that's where our goal is. That we would minister salvation to those that do not have it. Okay? So like I said, faith, grace, salvation. Works comes after Okay, so <clears throat> we have been working through the topic of money. And I told you a couple weeks ago there were a number of points that I wanted to make. I want to go through the ones that we've covered thus far. Um, we started off in Proverbs 11. I'm just going to read it for you. Don't turn there. Um, it says, one gives freely, yet grows all, uh, all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. Okay? And, and we talked about, you know, the difference between a stream and a pond. And, and that flowing, that cleansing water that, that flows and is always renewed. And that's what God is calling us to, to, to live generously, to, to hold nothing so tightly that, that we can't let it go. Because when you're holding on so tightly, you can't receive. Okay? So we hold things with open hands. Uh, Corey Ten Boom made a comment one time. She said, I have learned to hold things with an open hand and gently because I do not like when God forces my hand. Okay? And that's what we need to be with, with possessions. Now, we use the word mammon. You know, we've heard that, script, that scripture. You know, you cannot serve two masters. And, and you know, mammon. And, and mammon carries with it the idea not just of money, but possessions, stuff, things. So it's, it's all that money can bring you. And, and there are some people who have no problem with, with being free with their money, but don't touch my stuff. You know, don't touch my car, my truck, my motorcycle, my, my, my figurines. My mom used to collect dreamsicles. My mom is a phase woman. I don't know if you guys know what a phase woman is, but my mom is a phase woman. And when, when I was younger, her phase was clowns. And I tell you what, for children that have a, a fear of clowns, her place was a horror house. <laughs> because she had clowns everywhere. And, and then she got rid of clowns, and, and she went to dreamsicles. Now, you guys, does anybody here know what a dreamsicle is? Okay, to me, that sounded like some kind of ice cream bar. <laughs> and she said, you know, oh, for my birthday, I just want some dreamsicles. Here's the list. I'm thinking, orange and root beer? <laughs> what what dr dreamsicles? And evidently, they're little figurines of, like, cherubim-like, they're, they're things. things. <laughs> um, and, and she collected dreamsicles. And, and then when the dreamsicle phase ended, she, she moved on to Southwest stuff. And, and, and it, she, she moves in phases. And that's okay. Um, I don't think I would ever be in any one of those phases. But, you know, there were, there were things that when she was in a phase, don't touch. 
you know. She had a clown pillow. And, and I believe to this day that, that my mother was getting back at my children for something they did that I know nothing of. Because she took this clown pillow and she gave it to them. <laughs> now, Christopher and Donovan used to sleep in bunk beds. And poor Donovan was tormented for years because Christopher would take that pillow and he'd bang it the edge. And there was just enough light in the room and Donovan would look up and there'd be that evil clown pillow looking at him. And then he started talking to Christopher about why it bugged him so much. And all of a sudden Christopher didn't want the pillow in his bed either. <laughs> so the pillow ended up in another room. And, and, but we have this idea, you know, don't touch my stuff. Okay? In our family, it was my box of cereal. <laughs> Laugh all you want, but I tell you what, when I go to the grocery store and I want a box of cereal, and I get up on Saturday morning and the kids have eaten that entire <clears throat> box and I didn't get a single bowl, does not make for a happy Saturday. <laughs> okay? And then I got to eat their junky cereal that I don't want. And so I told Christy, I said, look, if they want that cereal, that's fine. Buy them a box. Don't let them eat mine. I want to at least taste it. You open the box and you, and because they put it back with like three pieces in the box, okay, because it's too much work to just throw that in the trash. And you open it up and you pour it and you get your three little nuggets. That's a depressing day. So my thing was, <coughs> mark it. If it says dad, you don't touch, okay? And when I have my box of cereal, okay, I, my, my bowl, then I'm okay. Okay, we can share. You can have some of dad's cereal. That's fine. Okay, because you know what inevitably happens. They say, oh, I want this box of cereal, this super delicious um, chocolatey crunch bomb thing. And I look at that and I think, that, that looks disgusting. And I smell it and I go, oh, it even smells worse. And they take like two bites of it and they realize how gross it is. And then they leave it in the closet forever. And then, you know, I come in and I want a bowl of cereal and guess what's left? <laughs> I've eaten so much garbage cereal because I can't see throwing it away. But now my kids have grown up and moved out, so guess what I do? Here, here's a box of cereal for your kids. They'll love this. Take it home. <laughs> Judah, Judah, you want some of this? It's delicious. Go put it in the van. So we talk about stuff. Okay, keeping our hands open. Proverbs, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about some other scriptures today, but Proverbs talks about this principle that, that if you give freely, you will receive back more. But that if you are stingy, you, you, you lose what you have. Okay? So principle number one is that generous giving leads to abundance. Okay? Now keep in mind, God's definition of abundance is probably radically different than yours. Okay? How much money is enough for Americans? No. Just a little bit more. Just a little more. Okay? Just a little more. I worked at a job in Houston where every year we had our review and, and you got a, a pay raise, a cost of living increase, and then <clears throat> on top of that you might get a merit raise. And, and I, I always waited for that time to come around because, well, man, when I get that raise, we're going to be on top. And two months after that raise, I can't wait for the next raise so we can get back on top. Because, you know, we get a little bit more, and what do we do? We increase our spending a little bit more than a little bit more. So, <clears throat> generous giving leads to abundance. Now, uh, there's been teaching since the 80s, uh, 90s, even into today, uh, about what abundance means. Um, you know, abundance might very well mean a Rolls Royce, but I'm betting it's not going to mean that for anyone in here. Okay? I'm betting that God has a better idea what abundance means to you to help you not sin. Okay? To, to help you not fall in sin. All right? So principle number two. Generous giving begins with tithing. Okay? Uh, now, you know, as I've been working through this, uh, I've, I've read a whole bunch of material by, by a wide spectrum 
of authors. Okay, and 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 regarding this specifically, I did not read any worldly authors because the principle that we're drawing out comes from scripture, and they don't understand scripture. Okay, so so there are times when I will look for other people's opinion outside of the church because I want to see what the world has to say about particular things. But when it comes to this, I didn't even go there. I just I stayed within the realm of Christianity. And and there were a number of things that, I mean, we got everything from, man, if you don't tithe, you're going to hell. And I'll speed your way. To tithing is a sin for the New Testament church. Now, I looked at both of those and went, what? And, 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 and I look at these scriptures, and these two extremes are using the exact same scriptures with completely opposite interpretations. I have a problem with that. Because Ephesians tells us that there is one God, one spirit, one body. There should be unity. Now, there's going to be differences because of what God may be doing in my life versus what he may be doing in your life. But to have a difference that's that wide... How, how do we reconcile that? <clears throat> I believe with all my heart that if we honor God with the first fruit of what He gives us, because what, what is the, the first understanding of money is it's all His. All of it is His. You're not giving God 10% of yours. You're giving back to God 10% of what He has given you. Okay, so when we understand that principle, um, you know, I, I believe with all my heart that we honor God right off the top before taxes, before insurance, before 401k, before whatever else you guys might have, I don't know. But, but we give God first. And I absolutely believe, both in the Old and the New Testament, that this principle bears out because the principle was established 400 years before the giving of the Mosaic Law. Okay? And we see in the New Testament that there are times that this comes up, but it's always indirectly, it's always with the assumption that this is going on. Okay? We talked about Jesus. If he was perfect, according to the law, did Jesus tithe? We had to. Okay? Because keep in mind, he came to fulfill the law. So he had to fulfill every point of the law. All right. So did Jesus tithe? Absolutely. You bet he did. What he tithed? I don't know. I don't know what a traveling preacher got in those days. But we know that there was something because Judas was the treasurer. So there was something there. Okay. So I believe absolutely that if you honor God with your first 10%, God will restore to you a, a, an abundance. All right. I believe that's, that's the challenge he lays out in Malachi, chapter 3. It's the only time in Scripture God says, test me. Only time. Okay? So, if you are generous in your giving and you start with your tithing, it's going to lead to abundance. Now, if you want more about that, feel free to look at the, the videos from the last couple of weeks. Um, point number three. Generous giving tests my faith. Somebody left an empty cup up here, and that's really deceiving. <laughs> Generous giving tests my faith. I shared with you last week how, Christian, I kind of walked through the principle of tithing and how, you know, even with 100% of what we were making, we could not pay all of our bills. You know, our, our bills would take like 100 and. 20% of what we made, not, not the 100% that we had. And, and, and we were both very convicted that we needed to tithe. It was something that, that I believe is a, a lifelong principle. And so we started tithing and, and we took the money and, and um, my own opinion about this. All right? This is my opinion. All right? So don't get, don't get all tight okay, if you have a different opinion. All right? My opinion about this is I always give in cash, okay? I never claim it on my taxes. I never let the government know what I've given. I never let other people know what I've given. It's between me and God, all right? God sees what Christy and I do, okay? That's my, my opinion 
of my interpretation of the scripture that my left hand doesn't know what my right is doing. Okay, now I know some of you are otherwise. I'm not, I'm not in any way condemning you. I'm saying this is what was convicted in my heart. All right? So when, when we started tithing, we took that cash and we put it in and it was hard. Because I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, there goes ambulance bill number one. There goes second surgeon that I never met, bill number two. It amazes me, the people that show up for money after you've had a procedure. Because when I, when I went in, I saw a nurse and I saw a doctor. I don't know if it was the doctor that actually worked on me, but it was some dude with a green thing around his face and on his head. And, and he leaned over and said something. And then I woke up and another guy in a, a kind of maroonish thing was leaning over the top of me and pushing me down the hall. And uh, I ran into him a couple days later and he said, hey, I, I think I took you out of surgery the other day. Yeah, I said, I kind of remember you. You were wearing kind of maroon. He said, yeah. He said, it was kind of weird. He said, I've never had anybody come out of surgery and ask me how my day was going. <laughs> how was your day going? <laughs> But then we started getting bills for these procedures, and, and there's like, you know, the first surgeon that may or may not have been in there. I think it was the guy I talked to, but I have no idea. And then there's the second surgeon. How many people you need to go get my appendix? What, what's the, you know, I mean, did you work jointly on the scalpel? What do you... And, and then there's the anesthesiologist. I know that person was there. I may never saw him, but I know I went out fast and I went out hard. Okay? God bless anesthesiologists. I paid that one willingly. Okay? And then there were, there were all of these other bills and, and things like that. And I'm looking at this money that I'm, I'm putting in the offering. I'm going, okay, God, I'm doing this out of obedience. I'm doing this in faith because you have required this of me. Okay? It tests your faith. And I shared with you the, the, the outcome of this. Okay? In God's economy of things, 90% with you and Him is greater than 100% of you alone. Alright? Because in God's economy of things, stuff happens that defies logic, that defies math. And, and we paid our tithes, and at the end of the month, every bill was paid. Every bill was paid. And we're sitting down and we're trying to figure out who did we miss. This can't work. It does not work logically. Because last month, we didn't tithe. We had more money and we were able to pay less bills. How does this work? And, and this started going. And then, then another thing started happening. People started, we'd call and, and get the balance of what we owed. And, and people would say, well, that bill has been paid off. That bill has been paid off? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, zero balance. You owe nothing. Okay? Now... That's our testimony, okay? Because I absolutely believe when God says, test me, bring your full tithe into the storehouse. When you bring your full tithe, he says, test me, and I will throw open the floodgates of heaven. I will pour out you on a blessing that you cannot contain until there is no more need, okay? So it's a test. You have to step out in faith, and then God moves. <clears throat> It, it, it would be so much easier if you would move first, wouldn't it? Okay, because it, then it wouldn't require faith. We could just kind of go happily along our way. But how many of us would tithe if God met all of our bills first? We, we'd all think that was great. We, you know, we'd find some way to figure out we were financial whiz kids. And, and we would leave God out. Um, Proverbs chapter 30 says two things that I would ask of you. And, and the second thing that he asks of God is give me neither too much nor too little. Don't give me too much because I might take the credit for myself and disown you. Nor give me too little that I would be tempted to steal bread and dishonor you. Okay? So, so there's a caution right there. So, uh, third point, giving tests my faith. Point number four. Now, last week I shared with you... Um, I look at, at giving in three lights, okay? I have three different categories. Don't freak out if somebody uses different words. These are Glenn words, okay? This is how Glenn does it. So don't get all upset if, if you'd use different words or, or so another pastor that you listen to uses different words or a book that you've read uses different words. This is, this, these are mine, all right? So in order for us to understand what I'm talking about, tithe, 
is the, the first 10% that you give to God. You just take that right off the top, you give it to Him. It's what He has required of us, okay? Giving is what you have done, what you have committed, whether God has led by your Spirit, prompted you. Um, it's something that you do that's ongoing, okay? For example, compassion. We have several compassion children that we uh, donate to monthly, okay? That's giving. We have certain things that we have committed to do either a short-term or a long-term, but an ongoing thing that we have committed to give completely separate from our topics. Okay, separate thing. All right? And then there's alms, which I am using. I, I know alms and, and giving can be used interchangeably, but I'm using, I'm separating them so you understand what I'm talking about when I use a particular word. Alms is what I, a one-time thing. Okay? Somebody comes into the church and, and expresses a need, and you answer that need in that moment. Okay? You have given alms. All right? Um, all three of these are all throughout Scripture. All three of these are, are necessary to be a generous giver. Now, uh, keep in mind that I, I don't think God is impressed with your amounts. As a matter of fact, I know He's not impressed with your amounts because He owns it all. And we remember uh, Jesus sitting outside the temple where the offerings were brought. And he was watching all of these guys come in with their money bags and their celebration and showboating and putting their offering in. And, and then the widow comes up with her two, her, her two mites, her, her, her two little copper coins, and, and, and she puts them in. And Jesus comments to his disciples. He says, that woman has given more than all of the others because they have given out of their abundance and she has given out of her need, everything that she possesses. Okay? See, it's, it's, it's a heart condition. It's a heart condition. It's easy to be generous when you have lots. Okay? It's hard to be generous when you are counting every dollar. Alright? So, we're going to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, I have heard a number of pastors speak on this passage and correlate it in some way to tithes. I, I, one of the things that I read, uh, they use this passage as a, to them, a very clear understanding as to why we don't tithe. Matter of fact, uh, one guy that I read said that, um, you know, this passage uh, with a couple others was very clear that tithing was a sin for the, the New Testament church. And I went, oh. So, we're going to take a look at some things. Before we get into it, though, I want to talk about why I don't believe this is tithing, why I believe this is giving. All right? This, this particular <laughs> passage, Paul is referring to the offering that they're going to be coming and collecting, and, and they're going to be taking it to Jerusalem. Okay? Now, if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'm going to build the step to why I believe what I believe. Um, in Acts chapter 11, it talks about a group of prophets that came from Antioch down to Jerusalem. And among the prophets was a particular prophet named Agabus. Okay, does anybody remember Agabus? Okay, he was believed to have been one of the 70. He was believed to have been in the upper <coughs> room. Um, he was a prophet that, that later in Acts, he's the one that came to Paul. And, and took off his sash and, and, and her belt and, and bound him up and said, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. Um, in in um, Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, um, Agabus is going to Jerusalem and he prophesies about a drought that is going to come upon the land. Okay? And, and what's interesting is all throughout Scripture, God gives these cool little nuggets that allows us to independently verify the veracity, the truth of His Word. Because He puts in a, a little comment, Luke, who did an incredible job as a biographer. Okay? He puts in this little snippet. He says, this happened when Claudius was emperor. Okay? So, looking back historically, we can see a period... Uh, emperor Claudius was, was emperor from 41 AD to about 54 AD. So we know at some point in there, there had to be a drought. Okay, that's what scripture tells us. 
But we know that Paul was writing Corinthians, specifically 2 Corinthians, right about 55 AD. And what he's doing now is he is going out and he is collecting the offering because the church in Jerusalem was particularly heavy hit for two reasons. One, the drought. Okay? When, when you have an agrarian-based society and there's no water to water the crops, everybody suffers. Everybody suffers. Okay? But two, the church in Jerusalem especially was under a lot of persecution. Okay, we, we remember that uh, Jesus told them to go out. They stayed in Jerusalem. Persecution came on, uh, especially in the guise of a young man named Saul, a Pharisee, who went from house to house arresting those that were believers and persecuting them and even putting some to death. Okay, so we know the church in Jerusalem was being persecuted. We know there was a drought. All right. But in uh, Romans chapter 15, I'm going to flip over there real quick. You don't have to go there. I'll read it for you. If you don't trust me, you can go there. I'm watching to see who turns. Okay. <clears throat> so Paul is writing to the Romans. And... Uh, In verse 25 of chapter 15, he's, he's telling them his plans. And he says, at present, however, because he's saying, well, I want to come visit you. And then, and then he changes. This is where I'm at. He says, at present, however, I am going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints of Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it. Indeed, they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings... They are also to be of service to them in their material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. Okay? So we see that Paul is, uh, he, has been, he and Barnabas have been sent out to make this collection. They've gone to all of the different churches. Word has gone out. We're taking the collection. The church in Jerusalem is in need. They're, they're under drought. They, they can't make ends meet. We, we need to bless them. He even goes so far as to say, hey, look, it was out of Jerusalem that the spiritual blessing of salvation came. So we need to return unto them materially the things that they need. It's, it's, it's a it's a win-win situation. Okay, so back to <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So, um, actually, I'm going to back up. One other scripture I want to read. I'm just going to back up to 1 Corinthians. I'll read a couple verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul is ra uh, wrapping up his letter, his first letter to the Corinthians. 16.1, uh, he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So we see that Paul has just given to the Corinthians his directive, hey, the collection is due. What I want you to do is at the first of the week, whatever God has laid on your heart, you put it to the side. Part of the reason I don't believe this is tithes is because Scripture tells a tithe is to be immediately sent to the church in Jerusalem. And if you couldn't do it immediately, there was a specific process you went through in order to fulfill all righteousness. All right? So um, there's, this, is, this is different. This is a different set of circumstances. And so he says, that, you know, I want you to set it aside. And then uh, when I come... We're going to set the, somebody to take all this money and they'll take it down to Jerusalem. And if you think it's a good idea that I go, I'll go as well. <clears throat> all right? So now we flip over to chapter 9, 2 Corinthians. Now it is superfluous for me to write to you about the ministry of the saints. For I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has already, or saying that Achaia has been ready since last year. <coughs> And your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I am sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. 
Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you are not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go ahead uh, to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift and not as an exaction. Okay? Um, Paul is establishing, hey look, I've already sent you word. This is what you promised to do. There are going to be some people coming with me in order that you would not be ashamed, that I would not be ashamed. Please make sure what you promised is ready. Okay? And, and so he's, he's kind of giving them forewarning. It's kind of a gentle nudge. Hey, you promised this. Make sure you own up to your promise. All right? And, and so we, we see a couple things here, but, but really what I'm really interested in is what comes next. Because does your Bible have a break between uh, verse 5 and verse 6? Mm -hmm. I hate that. I mean, I appreciate that it makes things a little bit easier to find, but it makes it look like there's two different thoughts going on here. There are not two different thoughts going on here. Okay? So put your finger over that break and pretend it's not there. All right? Because we're going to go right from, uh, so that it would be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction. The point is this. Okay? If this were really two different thoughts, you'd be going, the point of what? Why is he even starting with this? Okay, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Does that passage sound familiar to anyone? Okay, remember we talked about this whole giving is a principle. Okay, it's a principle. It's the way that God designed things to work. All right? And, and when sin came in, it twisted and it warped everything and it skewed our vision. And then when we look through the knot hole of the cross and we see how it's supposed to be, it, it, it kind of comes back into the shape that God wants, but it looks weird to us because we're so used to looking at everything cockeyed. Okay? So, so he's saying, okay, this is the principle. If you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. How many farmers do we have in here? How many people have gardens? That's farmer enough for me. Put your hands way up. Okay? Okay. Now, I love fresh green beans. I love them. If I wanted me a good crop of green beans, what would I have to do? Well, I could just ask you guys, but that's not my point. In order to get a good crop of green beans, I have to plant green beans, right? Okay? Now, if I want a lot of green beans, how many green beans do I need to plant? Lots. But, hey, God loves me, and God's generous, and God cares for me, so shouldn't I just plant the one, and I can eat all the others, and then wouldn't He bless that and give me such a generous crop? Now, that sounds kind of silly. It's silly because it's the principle. God has established this in nature so that we would understand and be able to apply it to monetary <clears throat> things. All right? If you sow generously, you will reap generously. Now, notice I am not saying sowing frivolously. <clears throat> there are times when God is going to tell you don't give. Put your money back in your wallet. Put your wallet away. I do not want you to give at this time. But I want to tell you that's going to be not normal. That's the exception, not the rule. Okay? That's the exception. Uh, we had a family that we were friends with for years and years and years. And they just came upon some hard luck, um, some health issues, uh, prevented him from being able to work. There were some things that were going on legally that prevented her from being able to work. And, and we were um, blessed to be in a position where we could help them frequently. And looking back, I see this now. I did not see it then. But looking back, uh, at some point in that process, 
they went from being um, receivers with grateful hearts to expectors of what was owed. And, and I didn't see this at the time, um, but this, this gentleman had called and he was sharing with me uh, an issue that they were dealing with. And, and uh, I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll pray about it and, and we'll see. And uh, I talked with Christian. I just kept getting this kind of, did you guys ever get that, you know, where it, in your brain? It's just like, it's not clicking right. Something feels off. And it, it kind of nags at you and worries at you. And you can't really put it into words. Um, and it's probably because you're not listening, just like I was not listening. And, and it, it took God to, like, shout in my ear, I don't want you to do this. I am trying to teach them a lesson, and you're getting in the way. And I went, but God, it, it, it says very clearly here, in your word, he says, yeah, there are also times when, when they didn't give. Uh, remember when Jesus fed the 5,000? Okay, then he goes across to the other side of the lake. And what happens to those 5,000? They chase him down. They chase him down. And what do they say? What's for breakfast? And he says, you don't understand. You're coming because I did this miracle providing food. But if you knew who I was, you would ask me for the food that would, uh, you would never be hungry again. And they say, okay, give us some of that. I hope it tastes like waffles. <laughs> and they, they, what happened? They wanted more of the same, but they misunderstood what the miracle was all about. The miracle was supposed to be not just filling their bellies, but turning their hearts and their minds to God. And they were just content with full bellies. And, and so Jesus did not do another miracle for those people. As a matter of fact, he, he kind of cautioned them. He said, hey, look, if you're going to follow me, things are going to get rough. <laughs> And, and then he said, you know, hey, uh, you, you need to eat of my body. And they went, all right, I'm out of here. Fish I can do for breakfast, but not body, not human. Okay, and, and it says a great number of them fell away at that time. All right, so back to verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness." You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to, the God, to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. <coughs> By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your con contribution for them and for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Now the first thing I want to draw out of this passage is you cannot separate the physical from the spiritual. Okay? You can't divide the two. They're knit together. They're, they're a part of a whole. Okay? And so when he's going through and he's talking about the gift, it's, it's so intertwined with God's grace and, and, and the miracle that God is doing in their spirit, in their soul, that you can't take them and pull them apart without ruining both parts independently. Okay? So the first thing I want to back up, um, we have this principle that God has established. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Okay, this is another reason that I believe this is a giving issue, not a tithing issue. I believe, however, there is a principle underlying this that we can apply to tithes, but it's not that verse. It's not that part of the verse. Okay? It says, let each one give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, whether you are giving in tithes, giving in offerings, giving in alms, I believe that God wants your heart so free from the bondage of mammon that you will rejoice 
and the giving. That, that you will delight in the giving. That money has so little hold on you that when God prompts you to give, you can rejoice. When God calls on you to be generous, you can rejoice. That it is with joy in your heart because God gave you what you have in the moment, what makes you think He won't supply for your need in the next moment. But God, if I have this, I can't watch my dish network. But God, if I give this, I can't whatever. Okay, whatever. Look, God has promised in His Word that He will meet your every need. But, but look, let's look at this principle as we go on through this. Um, a cheerful giver, you don't give reluctantly or under compulsion. That's not, that's not an out for us, guys. It's not like, well, I'm, I'm in a bad mood today. God ain't getting nothing. He gave me an out because I'm grouchy. That's not what that's saying. What it's saying is that your heart should be so changed by the Spirit living in you that mammon has no hold on you. That there's nothing that it can do to, to cause you to stumble. And then he goes on and he says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may, be, uh, you may abound in every good work. Notice there's, there's the grace that abounds to you, and then the work that follows after, and it's so wrapped up with all sufficiency in all things at all times. Now, notice, sufficiency is a different word than prosperity. Okay? Okay, because we have different understandings of this. We think sufficiency, what is sufficiency? It's enough to meet the need. Right? Okay? It's enough to meet the need. Now, one of the things that I, I would encourage you is when you obligate yourself to an ongoing bill, you have not obligated God. Okay? If you have done something foolish and you can afford a Chevy, but you're not content with the Chevy, so you go and buy a Cadillac and you say, God, you said... He said He would give you a sufficiency. I'll tell you one thing. You don't even need a Chevy. You don't need a car. What you need is a means to get from where you are to where you need to be. Okay? And we are so geared into the American cultural mindset that our needs are completely unrealistic to 90% of the world. Okay? And if you take on debt, and, and honestly, a lot of that is just sin, but if you take on debt, and then you try to commit God using scriptures like this, you've completely misunderstood this passage. Okay? Because this passage is talking about how God honors you in your generous giving. And so, His grace abounds to you so that you have sufficiency in all things at all times. Now, this is written by Paul who also wrote, I know the secret to be content, whether I have little or whether I have much. It's that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not having little or having much. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thankful to, thanksgiving to God. Now, do you see what the enriching is for? Why does God give you? I'm going to say that louder. So you can give. That's right. It's not for you to hoard. God gives to you so you have the ability to give. And then look what the result is. Look what the objective is. The objective isn't even just giving, is it? Because look at what the outcome is here. He says, it will produce thanksgiving to God. Because the end result of all of this 
is that God receives the glory. Not me, not you, not the church, God. Okay? By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contributions for them and for all others. So he's, he's, he's making this point even more significant. The end result of this, the end result of your salvation, the end result of your generosity is to bring God glory. <clears throat> While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, See, this is an, another principle that's going on here that we don't really talk about a whole lot. Paul is reminding them that the church in Jerusalem has the Corinthians in their heart and they are interceding for them. They are bearing them up in prayer. They are praying for them. They, they receive with joy the news of the salvation of the Corinthians in the Corinthian church. And, and they're embracing them and rejoicing because... God has glorified himself in their salvation. And, and it's almost as though, hey, this, the, the giving in this is really just kind of a footnote. Okay? And so I, I want to encourage you today, the, the idea of giving generously, and, and in this, in, in my definition, this would actually be alms, because even though they gave at the beginning of each week, it was for a one-time sum that was then carried to Jerusalem for distribution to those that were suffering in Jerusalem. Okay, But you notice he also says, he doesn't leave them out because he says, um, you, you're generous, uh, the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. So that this contribution, this, this giving was not just directed to the church in Jerusalem. There was supposed to be an ongoing giving that was for the needs of all the others as well. Okay? <clears throat> and then the last verse, he says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. He is bringing the focus around to what is the, the value here. It's not the money. Okay? It, it, it's not even their generosity in giving the money. The, the, the whole point of all of this, the inexpressible gift, is God's grace. So when we talk about money... It's a test. Um, we talk about it's, it's a, a revealer of your heart. It, it shows which God you are actually bowing down to in your life. Um, generous giving, giving alms, I believe is a personal choice. I believe it is spirit-led, but just as in all things, you can resist God's spirit. You can rationalize, you can excuse, you can, you can just be outright stubborn and put, stomp your foot down and say, I'm not doing it. Okay? That's a bad place to be, folks. That, that's outside um, the, the covering of God's grace, His umbrella of favor. Um, no, I'm not saying you're going to be kicked out of heaven. You're, you're going to get up and God's going to say, hey, remember that time I wanted to give 25 bucks to so-and-so? <clears throat> you're out. Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. But there is a definite blessing that comes from moving and operating in obedience to the principles that God has given us. There's the natural ramifications for sin. Things don't go well when you sin. Okay? So, number four in our list, generous giving is a personal decision. So, four points that we've made in the course of this talk about money uh, on the, the, the giving, okay? Four points that we've made. Abundant giving, generous giving leads to abundance. Okay, keeping in mind God's definition of abundance, not yours. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> generous giving starts with tithing. Generous giving is a test. And generous giving is a personal choice. Okay? So next week we're going to move on. I would encourage you. Um, we are going to be doing the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University class. 
Um, we're going to be starting that. What's the date? I know it's in the bulletin. Seventh. The seventh, October. Um, if money has gotten a hold of you, okay, I'm not. I'm not. You're in over your head. It's difficult to make things meet. Uh, you, 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 you just need some some wise counsel. We're, we're doing this Financial Peace University class. Um, now, Dave Ramsey takes sound biblical insight and he applies it to sound financial decisions. And he teaches people about making your money work for you. Being the master of your money instead of the money being your master. Okay, and the, the whole key to everything that he's going to talk about in this series is discipline. <coughs> discipline. That's the, the, the same root for disciple, folks. When we are called to be disciples, we're called to be a people that are disciplined. Okay, we choose to embrace what we will do and what we want to. I would encourage you, take this course. It's a 10-week course. Uh, it's a video series. We'll be meeting here at the church. Um, the cost is $100 to buy the packet. If you cannot afford the packet, please talk to me. Okay? We'll get you the packet if we need to. Because I think it's that important. Um, you know, the American mindset is, hey, put it on credit. Get a loan. Get a car. Plastic. Okay? A lot of what the American mindset is, is just outright sin to the principles that God has laid out in His Word. So, <clears throat> Father, we bless you today. I thank you, Father, that you have given us very keen insight in how we should view money, how we should handle money, how we should give. Father, that we would not be slaves to mammon, that we would not be slaves to the lenders, but, Father, that we would be a, a people set free from that bondage. And I ask, God, that you would settle in our hearts. Father, if there would be any here that is uh, struggling with, with mammon, I ask, Lord God, that you would reveal in their heart and their mind that they're under bondage, that you desire to deliver them. I ask, Lord God, that you would continue to lead us that we would honor you with all that we have and all that we are. And we bless you this morning. We thank you for loving us so much that, Father, you tell us the hard things sometimes. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>